الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين. All praises due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for us our presence here in Jeddah. It's important for us to reflect on why we are here. Because there are many people in the Muslim world who would love to be here. They would give an arm and a leg to be here in Jeddah, so close to Mecca, to be able to live here. But in spite of their desire, and possibly also their efforts, they're not here, and we are here. So obviously, it is Allah's qadr, not our good luck, because there's no such thing as good luck. It is Allah's qadr which has determined our presence here. Therefore, we have to consider this unique circumstance and reflect on what should be gained from this circumstance. Because Allah brought us here for a reason. He didn't bring us here to eat, drink, and be merry, to chew on the grass like the cattle, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has compared disbelievers to saying, Hum kal an'am, bal hum adal. This is not our purpose here. Just to earn some money, procreate, enjoy, and die. Allah brought us here for a higher purpose, a higher reason. A reason which is of necessity connected to our very purpose of creation. We all know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us for His worship, to worship Him. Not because He needs that worship because it doesn't benefit him in any way. And if we didn't worship him, it doesn't harm him in any way. So when we say that Allah created us to worship him, it is because we need to worship him for our own benefit. What is that benefit? The benefit is that through worshiping him, as he prescribed for us to worship him, we can then attain the very goal of our lives, which is paradise. Allah has created us for paradise. As he created Adam and Eve, Put them in the garden of paradise. This is where it all started from. Due to their disobedience, they left. And since then, everybody has been trying to get their way back, find their way back. To get back to that goal, that place for which Allah has created us, the fundamental root is through worship. Ibadah, worshipping Allah. And that's why we are created to worship Him. Because He created us for paradise. 
and the way to get to paradise is to worship him. Therefore, he created us to worship him in order for us to go to paradise. But, as some non-believers would ask, so why didn't he just put us in paradise and be done? Why go through all of this in this life and struggle and mistakes, punishments and all these other kinds of things? Why not just put us in paradise and be done? Wouldn't that be easier? The point is that if Allah had wanted beings who were created for paradise and would not do anything other than what was needed to be done to go to paradise, he would have repeated the creation of the angels. The angels don't disobey Allah. They do whatever they are told. So if it is just doing whatever you are told to be to paradise, Allah already created beings who could just be in paradise, no problem. But He decided to create beings for paradise but he gave them a choice of whether they wanted to go or not. So that they could choose for themselves paradise. And the only way was for there also to be hell for those who didn't choose paradise. Because again, disbelievers ask, why did God create hell? If he's a merciful and kind and caring God, why hell? So that those people who didn't want paradise would have some place to go. That's for those who didn't want paradise. Simple. Because if there was no place to go other than paradise, there's no choice. Right? So then what was the point of creating beings, giving them the ability to make a choice, and then they had no choice? That would be pointless. And God does not create anything which is pointless. Everything has a purpose and a reason. So, our goal, we are here in Jeddah, Allah has chosen us to be here in Jeddah in order for us to worship Him through our presence here in order to gain that goal of paradise. So we have to ask ourselves, does our life reflect that? Does our life reflect this goal? Or does our life reflect something else? You know, if your goal is to be a race car driver, Hamilton, you want to be Formula One number one. When you talk to people, it's always in your conversation. You are thinking about it all the time. You will be talking about the cars and the speed and the gasoline which is necessary, the type of wheels and, you know, you will have a one-track mind. That's how people are. That's our nature, isn't it? So, if we look at ourselves and we find that we are not talking about paradise, what it takes to get to paradise. Instead, what we're talking about is getting a nice villa, getting a nice car, the kids, the vacation, 
success in the dunya. This is all our conversation. It's either that or we're backbiting, talking about other people. So we have to say that our existence here is not reflecting the goal that we're supposed to have in our lives. That means then we're off track. We're not on Sirat al-Mustaqim anymore. We might think we are, but reality, actions, as they say, speak louder than words. So if our actions indicate that we are just about the dunya, we're not about doing what is necessary to help us reach that goal in this life, then we have to say that we have to say that we are really not about fulfilling the purpose of our creation. In fact, we have by default chosen hell. This is, a, this is a bad thought. It's not something nice. I'm sure nobody feels comfortable with that thought. But as they say, if the shoe fits, wear it. So if this is not the shoe we want to be wearing, then we need to turn our lives around here, here in Jeddah. We need to find meaning for our lives, put meaning back into our lives here, real meaning, meaning which is connected to getting to paradise. And among the well-established ways for getting on that path is seeking correct knowledge of Islam. We know Prophet Muhammad وسلم, made the seeking of knowledge obligatory. A religious duty on every single Muslim when he said Talabul ilmi farida ala kulli muslim. A religious duty, farida. We all know farb, obligation. Religious obligation, meaning you don't fulfill that obligation, you are in sin. It's not optional. It's not if I feel like it, when I feel like it. It is an obligation, like anything else that we feel really is an obligation on us which causes us to act on it on a daily basis regularly in the same way we are driven for those other things we feel are obligatory we should be driven to know Islam to know the necessary information about Islam which will keep us on the right path on Sirat al-Mustaqim heading for Jannah. We don't necessarily need to know all of the knowledge of Islam. How to calculate inheritance. We don't need to necessarily know that. But wherever a situation arises, where issues of inheritance arises, then we have to get that knowledge. Either we learn it ourselves, or we go and ask those who know, if we don't know, as Allah said, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask those who know if you don't know. So we have to seek that knowledge. The process of seeking knowledge is an ongoing process which should be an, an integral part of every Muslim's life. We are constantly involved in seeking 
more knowledge of Islam in order for us to practice it. Not seeking knowledge simply to be able to know certain facts and to quote it on certain occasions when people will say, oh, what a knowledgeable brother. Oh, mashallah. No. It is to gain that knowledge so that we can benefit from it through applying it. Because Prophet Muhammad وسلم, used to regularly make the dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from knowledge which is of no benefit. This includes false knowledge as well as true knowledge. But knowledge which we don't benefit from, which we will be held responsible for. So in order for us to be on that path, to fulfill the goal, the very purpose of our creation, we need to be constantly engaged in seeking knowledge. Knowledge first and foremost about Allah. To be clear, to have no doubts in our minds and our hearts about Allah. We are certain. Knowledge about the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We should have clear knowledge. Know who He is. Not necessarily all of the details of His life, but the essence of the message that He conveyed. That is the knowledge that is going to benefit us. Knowing that it was the 10th year of the Hijra when this took place or that took place or the 8th year and that. These numbers, not that important. But knowing what took place and the relevance of what took place in our lives, that is what is important. They call that fiqh sirah Understanding the biography of the Prophet to understand what are the lessons in it that we can learn from and apply in our lives so that it benefits us. Because always we're looking at benefit. Where does it, how does it, when does it benefit us? If we can't answer that question, then no, leave it. Leave it. We should be somewhere else, doing something else. Western philosophy, secular, the secular approach to seeking knowledge, to education is knowledge for the sake of knowledge. This idea is repeated in the minds of students in the universities, etc. It is knowledge for the sake of knowledge. But in Islam, that's not the case. In Islam, it is knowledge for the benefit that comes from it. So that we would be beneficial to others. That knowledge would be beneficial to ourselves and at the same time beneficial to others. And that's why Prophet Muhammad Wasallam had said, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ the best of you are those who learn the Quran and teach it to others. He didn't just stop after saying, the best of you are those who learn the Quran. That's what we tend to do. So and so learn the Quran, mashallah. They can recite the Quran beautifully, mashallah. You know? And we can make pop stars of Quran reciters. Who's your favorite reciter? Oh, so, did you hear him? Shawi, did you hear? Mishari, did you hear this one? Man, his recitation, mashallah, mashallah. But was that the purpose of the Quran? No. 
the Quran was for reflection. As Allah said, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Will they not reflect on the meanings of the Quran? Or are their hearts sealed up? So Allah stresses here reflection on the meaning so that what? So that we can act on it. And that's how the Sahaba were with the Quran. They said we used to learn 10 verses at a time. And we wouldn't go on to more until we had understood what was in those 10 and we were trying to apply it. After that, then we went on. But today, we have courses, you know, compressed courses. They offer in the summer here, for example. In three and a half months, you can memorize the whole Quran. Boom. In three and a half months. But what are you going to do with it? What of it have you understood? You have put on your back a burden which you are not prepared to carry. So it is about the benefit. Always we look at the benefit. Whatever Islam tells us to do, it is the benefit. And the same way we have to teach our children. When we teach them salah, it's not do salah because I told you to do the salah. But why? You're a Muslim. Muslims pray, so you should be praying. That's it. That's as far as it gets. No. We should enlighten them to the benefits of salah. How is it going to benefit them? So if they can appreciate the benefit, then they will do it when you're not around. But if they're only doing it because you've commanded them, then no, when you're not around, they're not going to do it. Very simple. So the whole of Islam, fasting, everything of Islam, as we teach our children, we should get them to understand why. And if we don't know why, then we need to find out. Because it means we have a problem. We have a fundamental problem. If we don't understand what the benefits of fasting are, how it benefits us. If we're only thinking of fasting as God made this obligatory on me, so I'm paying my dues. I do it. He said do it and I'm doing it. But I don't understand what it is supposed to do. What is the benefit? So Ramadan for us is just a ritual. Every year we just keep doing the same thing over and over again. It doesn't change us. Our character remains the same. It has no impact on us. There's no benefit from it. It's just a ritual. We do it over and over and over again. Same thing with Umrah. Same thing with Hajj. Same thing with all of Islam. So it is essential for us as adults to know the reasons behind the acts of worship, the ibadah. Ritual will not take us to paradise. But ritual which is understood, whose benefits are grasped, and whose actions are done in order for those benefits to be achieved, then that can take us to paradise with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, these are just some thoughts I wanted to share with you this afternoon. Remembering why we're here, why Allah brought us here, and how our presence here can help us get to paradise. We need to think about it.
the dawah effort which is being done here by the center is of course an effort to convey the message of Islam to the community and to those who are not a part of the community. We should be involved in it. This is our center. This is for our benefit. For us to gain knowledge and for us to share that knowledge with others. So our programs shouldn't be ones which where there is food people come in droves. Where there's no food announced we show up occasionally. See, this is telling us, right? These actions tells us what's happening here. What's on people's minds? Where is the focus? When we're coming eagerly when there's food, it means we're like the cattle that we spoke about in the beginning. The cattle. When they see there's more grass on the other side of the field, they're going to be going over to the field to eat the grass. So that's us. When there's food, we're there. When there's no food, we're not there. This is not the way we should be. So, we should strive. Know that Allah has brought us here for a purpose. That purpose is to find a way to help us get to paradise to take the benefit of the knowledge that is available in the programs that are being held here and to take that knowledge and share it with those that are close to us, those who are our contacts in the society, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. This is our responsibility. This puts meaning in our lives, takes our lives from the just day-to-day -day mundane nine to five job you know you go off to work you come home you eat you sleep next day you're back out again it's just a continual ritual cycle based only on your or our material needs this is not what we're here for yes we do have to take care of material needs this is real but this is not our primary purpose. Our primary purpose is to take care of our spiritual needs. So Allah has given us certain opportunities here which we wouldn't have were we back home. So we will be asked, what did you do with these opportunities? What did you do with the knowledge which was available? What did you do with your time which was granted to you? How did you utilize it? Did you waste it? Did you kill it? Or did you use it to benefit yourself and benefit others? So, I hope that inshallah Allah would touch all of our hearts, including myself, and revive the spark and the desire to want to practice this deen sincerely, doing it for the sake of Allah, for the benefit that we stand to gain from it, and to treat our time as something valuable, something precious, which we really can't afford to waste. Instead, we should be shifting from one form of ibadah to another. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ if you finish one form of ibadah, of worship, then transfer to another. Our whole life is supposed to be worship. When we're able to transform that life into worship, 
then we are on that path to paradise. Seeking knowledge is to help us to make that transformation. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ had said, مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَهَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Whoever takes a path in which he or she seeks knowledge, Allah makes the path to paradise easy for them. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the path for us all here easy and that we share this knowledge, this information to those around us and make it easy for those who are close to us, those who are dear to us. And with the spread of this understanding, then we can transform our smaller communities, our homes, our families, our neighborhoods, eventually we can transform the Muslim world. But we have to begin with ourselves. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Phillips. We'll just proceed with the questions. I have a question uh, I'm going to ask before you can. Um, we, we here now come to, to uh, Jeddah or uh, King of Saudi Arabia. We face a little dilemma with our kids, especially the ones who are Arabic language is not our first language. Um, we decide to send our kids to Quran schools and to memorize Quran, but others have told us let them learn Arabic first and memorize Quran. Which one is, is more preferable or which is better? Memorize Quran first, or I mean, maybe you can learn Arabic at the same time, but for the kids I'm talking about. So, can you read really more on that? You want to answer the question? Or are you just scratching your head? Oh, okay. We shouldn't assume that he didn't have an answer. Some talks I've given. How old are you? Eight. Yeah. Some talks I've given, I've seen little eight-year-olds come up with some heavyweight questions. You know. But anyway, I hope your head's not ditching you anymore. Um, the issue of memorizing Quran as a child or learning Arabic first. Well, to memorize the Quran without at least learning how to read Arabic, it's not going to happen. Very, very difficult. The reading, so you have to learn one level of Arabic at least to be able to read what is written. And we can make an exception for children because in those early years, they are really only imitating, parroting whatever they see around them. That is the nature of their character, their personality, their mentality. They imitate well. So for them to memorize it whilst they're still quite young and then learn Arabic and study and understand it, no harm. There is no harm in that. But truly, in the course of memorizing, the children should be given, even the small children should be given some understanding of what they're memorizing. So they understand that there's something behind it. It is not just these words that we memorize like a parrot, but there is actually some meaning. And for young children, what you do is that in the, the meaning, you, you bring out things which are interesting to them. They like stories. So where the stories come, you give them the story. So they got some benefit out of it in terms of the lessons the moral lessons that are there because the stories of the Quran are filled with moral lessons. So we're giving them something of morality. So they're growing while memorizing. 
Very, very important. You know? Because in that way, if we're teaching them in that way, then they will enjoy learning the Quran. But if we teach them in the traditional way, which has become widespread in the Muslim world today, that traditional way is fundamentally a way of abuse. A way of abuse where the Quran teacher will have a stick and the child only learns with the stick. So he's beaten until he learns the Quran. And many children hate the Quran because of it. Many children hate the Quran because of it. This mode of teaching which has become the common mode in much of the Muslim world today is evil. It is not from the Sunnah at all. It is an evil way, a cursed way. And that's why you have the cursed product of that way. People leaving Islam. And when you ask them why, they say, because Islam was taught to me with a stick. I was beaten. I didn't really want to know this. I didn't want to learn it, but I was beaten. I was abused. In the subcontinent, the children who don't listen to their Quran teacher, they are made to take a position known as the chicken. The chicken position, in the chicken position, the child squats. He puts his hands under his knees. He holds his ears. And he has to stay. I know see you shake, many of you shaking your heads. You know it well, right? I've forgotten the name in Urdu. If I say the name in Urdu, everybody else will be shaking their heads, right? It's called the chicken in English. So this way, where you have to stay in that position for five minutes or 10 minutes, depending on, is torture. There's not much difference between that and Guantanamo. Yes. It is evil. This is not the way to teach the Quran. This is not the way. Most young people will be turned off. So, learning the Quran with understanding where the attractive elements are brought out, the children in love, it, love it, they like to hear the stories and that. As modern educational philosophy teaches, make learning fun this is what they teach this is what they pound into the heads of the teachers make learning fun so whatever you have to teach your children if you can make it fun meaning it's enjoyable they like it it will be embraced by them and they will keep it throughout their life but when learning becomes painful torture abuse, then know that the counter will be the product. Young children growing up and hating Islam because of it. Uh, continuing with the same similar question, is it, is it an obligation to learn Arabic? It is an obligation to learn uh, enough Arabic to do your prayers. To be able to say the Adhan, the basic, basics, to give greetings, salam, salam alaikum, wa alaikum salam. That much Arabic we should learn. 
but to become fluent in Arabic, this is not an obligation, but it is still preferable in order to be able to read the Quran and to understand it or hear it and to understand it as it was revealed rather than to understand it through interpretations etc to be able to hear Allah's word we know that the Quran is a miracle it is not a miracle in translation it is a miracle in Arabic so this is why Arabic is important and the Arabic language also links the Muslim world so that we can pray with our brothers and sisters wherever they may be in the world. If it wasn't the language of our prayers, etc., Adhan, etc., and we went to China, where masjids don't look like the typical masjids, and the Adhan was given, we wouldn't know. If we stumbled into a masjid and the Imam is beginning the prayer and he's doing it in Chinese, again, we wouldn't know. But because the prayer in Islam is in Arabic, it means Muslims anywhere in the world can pray with each other. It binds us all together. And also, of course, as we said, it is the language which God chose to reveal his final message to humankind. We, we have three groups of questions, so I divided them. Uh, we'll start with Dawah. Uh, the first question is, is it an obligation to, get, to make Dawah? It is an obligation on the community as a whole to convey Allah's word to those who don't know it. They call that Fard Kifaya. If some people from among the community take up this responsibility, the rest are not held responsible. But as leading scholars have pointed out, like Sheikh bin Baz and others in their writings, that in our times where this job is not being done. We don't have those who are consistently in taking up this responsibility and carrying the word. Then it falls now on each and every individual. It becomes fard ayn, an individual obligatory duty. That is the status of da'wah today in the Muslim world an obligatory individual duty. Meaning that each and every one of us is obliged, but we're only obliged to do da'wah based on the knowledge that we have. Not to do da'wah based on ignorance. If we don't have knowledge in an area, then we don't try to give da'wah in that area. We convey whatever we have learned. Whatever knowledge we have, certain knowledge from the Quran or from the Sunnah, we try to convey that. As the Prophet ﷺ had said, بَلِّغُوا anni وَلَوْ aya." Convey whatever you have learned from me, even though it be a single verse of the Quran. Uh, should I give money for Dawah projects first or to the poor? Again, you know, whenever we have to choose between good acts, we look to see the benefit. If we have people who are poor and desperate around us, then helping them becomes priority. If we can give to them and also give to the da'wah, then that is even better. If there are no really 
destitute people around us, then giving to the dawah makes most sense. So we always judge things according to the benefit. Wherever the benefit is more, it's greater, then we try to do whatever is to be done there. How can we do the dawah to the non-Muslims here in Jeddah? Uh, I guess the ways. Well, the ways of dawah are many. I mean, that's a lecture of a month. It is enough to know that we have the obligation to convey the message and it's just to find the opportunity. Whether you do it in your workplace, you do it with your neighbor, you do it whenever you have the opportunity. That's the point. You should have with you dawah materials. Keep it in your car. You go to the supermarket for women. You go to the supermarket or to the store. There's a female clerk or whatever who is working there, non-Muslim. Strike up a conversation, pass on a pamphlet or a DVD or a booklet. Go ahead. So, uh, brother's comment concerning the importance of character in giving the da'wah, and we know that the character of Prophet Muhammad wasallam was the deciding factor because of which the first people who accepted Islam chose it. Which is why I said from the beginning, when you are at the supermarket, strike up a conversation. Try to be friendly. Smile in that person's face. Let them feel friendship. That's the character. You didn't just get your, book, get your goods and then, okay, take this and you're gone. You know? Speak to them in a nice way. Let them feel you, you're offering them something which is pleasant. So you try to build relationships. Your most effective dawah is going to be when you're dealing with people with whom you have won over their hearts because the dawah is about winning hearts. Winning minds come along with it. But if you haven't won the heart, Winning the mind is very difficult. So, character becomes a critical component of dawah. Is it a sin to shave the beard or for a sister to take off the niqab? I think these are the usual questions that have been asked how many times, right? We can refer him to a website or something. Yes, you can go to islamqna.com, etc. But the key is not so much the issue of sin. Because all of us are sinning. The Prophet ﷺ said, Kullu bani Adam khatta. All of Adam's descendants are sinning, making mistakes all the time. وَخَيْرَ الْخَطَّائِينَ التَّوَّابُونَ And the best of those who sin, make these mistakes, are those who turn back to Allah in repentance. So what's most important is for us to recognize our sin, shaving the beard, 
everybody knows that it's a sin. So I don't need to tell you shaving the beard is a sin. You've heard it said so many times already. The issue is knowing that it is a sin, what are you going to do about it? As the Prophet Sallallahu had said, repent. Feel bad. Turn back to Allah. Ask for His help. And overcome it. With His help, inshallah, we can overcome. In the case of niqab, of course this is something which scholars have differed about. Some scholars hold that it's obligatory. If you've read their arguments and you're convinced it's obligatory, then for you it is obligatory. Other scholars hold it's not obligatory. If you've read their arguments and you're convinced that it is not obligatory, then it's not obligatory for you. This is a relative matter. So, best thing again is to seek knowledge. Read. Listen, hear the evidences, and what you are convinced is the truth, follow it. Just to see the question from a sister. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Please tell that what is the way to keep children not to watch cartoons? <laughs> I guess it's not allowed to watch cartoons. Of course, the question about children watching cartoons will depend on how you view cartoons in the first place. If you view it as something haram fundamentally, then the simplest solution is to get rid of the TV. That's the simplest solution. At least in your home, you're able to control that environment. But if you're not of the opinion that it is haram, then what you need to do is to get cartoons which are Islamic. Because watching cartoons is something which kids are doing all the time when they go to visit their friends' place, they're going to be there too. So rather than just deny them we should always try to find alternatives alternatives which are islamic which are pleasing to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as we can so my advice would be to try to get islamic cartoons and there's a lot of those that have been done in recent times and to let your children watch that instead but Anyway, you don't want the children to be too much involved in television. You know, it is better to utilize their time in things which are, again, more beneficial to them. Better you get them a book, get them into reading. Books which will convey stories, which is what they like. You know, they enjoy reading they will read and benefit and grow and it's much better environment than cartoons. Because even Islamic cartoons are limited. You're going to run out. And then what? Uh, we're having more and more questions, but I think this is a priority question. Uh, can I be displeased with what Allah gave me, gave me in my life? Well, can here means is it halal? Because of course you can. But if we say what Allah gave you in your life is Allah's qadr, can we be, is it permissible for us to be displeased with what Allah has destined? I think everybody knows it's not. Everybody knows it's not. The 
Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had told us that the affair of the Muslim is amazing. The true Muslim is amazing. And it is only in the case of the true Muslim. Whenever good comes to him or her, they thank Allah. That's what he started with. They thank Allah. This is the first critical characteristic of the believer. He is thankful to Allah. She is thankful to Allah. The Fatiha begins, the very first word of the Fatiha is Alhamdulillah. We start off giving thanks to Allah. Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Whenever any good thing happened in his life, the first thing he would do is what? Fall down on his face. Make sijda. Sijda to shukr. The prostration for thankfulness. If I ask you here, how many people made sijda to shukr today? Put your hand up. One person. How many people made it this week? Put your hand up. Four people. What is this saying? No good has happened in our lives. All week, no good happened in our lives today. So there's nothing that we have to say Alhamdulillah for. This is a forgotten sunnah and a very important sunnah because when we are thankful then life becomes pleasant. When we are not thankful life becomes unpleasant. When we are not thankful we are complaining about stuff. We are always complaining. We are never satisfied. You know? We go into depression. People are killing themselves because the gratitude factor is missing in their lives. So this is the characteristic of the true believer. Whenever good comes, he or she is thankful to Allah. And whenever evil occurs, what Allah is destined in their lives, what happens? He or she is patient with Allah. Patient with what has happened. And Allah will reward them for it. So for the believer, this situation is what is known in motivational terminology as a win-win situation. That's the way of the believer. It's win-win. There's no loss. It's not a win-lose situation. It's always win-win. We try to look and see how we can make whatever happens in life a win-win situation. I have a double question here. Same question. Worship uh, is only salah, uh, fasting, hajj, seeking knowledge. What are the forms of worship are considered worship? Well, we have worship which, is, which are acts which are prescribed for worship, meaning they're purely, fundamentally worship. Then we have other acts which are not prescribed for worship, but we turn them into worship when we do them conscious of Allah and following the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When we do it that way, then our whole life can become worship. Having grown up in the West, I'm always comparing life here and there. Is it a real loss if I move back, meaning to the U.S.? Or West? <clears throat> well, if you're always compla comparing between the life there and here, and 
you're thinking of moving back. And obviously, you have not understood the good that is for you here. Or, there is there greater good that you can do in order to help yourself get to paradise. It could be this or that. But in most cases, it is dissatisfaction with the situation here from a financial perspective. You're not making as money as you thought you were going to make. Life is not as easy as you thought it was going to be. You know, your expectations were not met. But we have to understand why did we come here in the first place? Was it for the dunya or was it for the akhirah? If it was for the akhirah, then we shouldn't be thinking in terms of going back if it was really for the Akhirah. But if it was for the dunya, then yeah, that's what people will do. They will think in terms of going back. Uh, there's two questions that could be answered, I think, maybe at the same time, about children again. Uh, how can we mold our child as a, as a good Muslim when they're brought up in a free and advanced environment? And secondly, in what way can we convince our children to learn the Quran and make make them and to make them uh, feel enjoyable? As you reiterated earlier. On. So I guess the first question would be the one: How can we bring them uh, in, in a good way, a good Muslim, in such a free and advanced environment? It's a difficult question really to answer because this may depend and de you know, on the existing circumstance which the child is in. It could be an issue of you changing the circumstance and that will make it easier. It could be an issue of you changing the teacher and that would make it easier. So really there is no clear single answer for this except to say that for the child to develop a love of the Quran and memorizing Quran etc you need to create an environment of teacher and uh, location circumstance which is or which encourages or which is encouraging to the child to learn the Quran so whatever you need to do to make that circumstance more attractive, more enjoyable, etc., then that's what you need to do. <laughs>